put a lot of excitement in my heart, I should say. Uh, a hugely heart-lifting story. The Nigerian boy, Nathaniel Nabena, if you remember, uh, we told you about it a couple of weeks ago, is in remission of cancer after his tragic story was held on a rise news TV and donation poured him to help him for a successful treatment. Doctors at London's Great Ormond Street Hospital even waived some of their fees to give the nine-year-old from Lagos State life-saving chemotherapy. Our special correspondent, John Cookson, reports. In February, I brought you the story of Nathaniel, a nine-year-old Nigerian boy who came to this country for a routine operation. But during tests, doctors found that he was suffering from a rare form of cancer. It was an aggressive form of leukemia. Nathaniel had difficulty moving his limbs and could barely speak. Without chemotherapy, the nine-year-old had only months, maybe weeks to live. Doctors at the world-famous Great Ormond Street Hospital said they could treat Nathaniel, but as he was a Nigerian national, not for free on the UK National Health Service. Private treatment would be £800,000, an impossible sum for Nathaniel's parents to find. After Nathaniel's story aired on a rise and was picked up by British mainstream media, something dramatic happened. Money started pouring in to the family's GoFundMe page. With treatment part funded, Nathaniel was admitted to Great Ormond Street. Chemotherapy began. And this is him three months later. A happy nine-year-old facing months more of painful treatment, but he's going to live. Nathaniel, what's the treatment been like? Has it been... Well, it's been painful. Very painful? Yeah. yeah. And when you make a recovery, what are you hoping to do? What are you looking forward to? I hope to ride my scooter and go back to school. Are you missing Nigeria or do you like it here in the UK? I like it here in the UK. You like it? Um, we're happy to say that he's right now he's in remission. Um, we had a very, very um, bad case. Um, at, um, his, he had what they call like a 60% blast in his blood and bone marrow. Uh, which the doctors are already giving up already. But um, the hospital and, um, took on his case um, with, you know, and at the end of the day, this is Nathaniel. It's amazing. Very amazing. So, you know, the last time I saw you, mm -hmm. Nathaniel, frankly, was dying, wasn't he? Yeah, sure. No, he's not anymore. At all. At all, he, um, he has a new hope now, and um, he has been treated, but not cured yet, because the doctors have lined up. They said if they leave him this way, the leukemia might come back. So they want to carry out a stem cell transplant, which um, we are in the process of. Nathaniel's parents still have to raise a further £200,000 to complete the treatment. They do say you should never work with animals or children. But now, with the backing of British TV celebrities like Paul O'Grady, who's pledged his full support, they're cautiously optimistic. Meanwhile, Nathaniel's mother had this message for those who've donated so far. The last time he came, and now there's a real difference. He was dying there, but now look at him. There's a new hope for him. So I just want to thank you. I'm so, so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nathaniel's parents believe they've witnessed a modern day miracle. And this reporter wouldn't disagree with that. John Cookson, Arise News, South London. Wow. Wonderful one there. Uh, Tony, your comments on this. Hope springs eternal, doesn't mm. it? I mm. mean, this is just an amazing, I'm so moved, heartwarming story. And the work continues. I encourage everybody to continue donating to get Nathaniel back to absolute 100%. I'm just, <laughs> sorry, so moved, sorry. sorry. Well, the last time we discussed this, it was really very sad because uh, the pictures of Nathaniel and Abena that were shown at that time showed him in a very bad situation. And even the parents, Ibisido and Mudupe, uh, were really very uh, completely shattered. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, um, there was an appeal for funds to support him. 
And at the end of the day, uh, they were able to raise over 87,700 pounds, uh, which was used to provide uh, six rounds of chemo. And, you know, that's why he's responded very well to treatment. But first, we have to commend all the persons whose uh, systems, the make of human kindness flows, and who donated that initial money uh, that was used to, uh, uh, you know, treat him, to do the chemo treatments. Second, we also have to commend the uh, consultants at the Great Osmond Hospital in London. Now, under UK rules, uh, Nabena is not entitled to the NHS, uh, but these uh, doctors, they decided to treat him free. They waived their consultant uh, fees. And they are even not uh, treating him under NHS time. They are treating him, you know, in their private time. And I think that they've shown, you know, a great uh, humanity in that respect. And then we also have to commend all the media houses, uh, you know, that projected uh, the story. However, according to his uh, doctor, Professor uh, Ajay, that's the consultant treating him, Ajay Vora, that's the name of the professor. He says that he has to go for the stem cell treatment by May 14, this same May 14, and that they need a sum of 201,000 pounds, latest May 12. So he still needs that support, and the fear of the doctor is that if he, he doesn't get that amount, you know, the uh, cancer could, uh, could uh, you know, uh, come back, and that at that point, uh, it may become a terminal. So I think we should still continue to appeal uh, to all, uh, you know, kind-spirited persons out there. What he needs urgently now is uh, just a little over 200,000 pounds. And once he's able to, to get that, you know, the doctors are saying that, you know, we can uh, all celebrate. So this is a story uh, about hope. And it's good to see that the parents are very optimistic that the entire community out there a global community that is will come to his rescue. The place to uh, contribute is helpnatan.com.ng. Mm -hmm. uh, there are also other, you know, uh, GoFundMe uh, sites uh, that are out there. And the uh, Sunday Mirror, uh, the Sunday Mirror specifically, has also launched, you know, an appeal mm -hmm. uh, in support of this young man. One more point to be made is that, uh, you know, this nine-year-old, uh, he went to London for prosthetic surgery. And then he took ill, and then they discovered that he had this uh, leukemia. Mm. Now, if that had happened here in Nigeria, mm. and the father alluded to this, that look, there is no way they could even have been able to do anything if that had been discovered in Nigeria. And I think I hope uh, that uh, you know Nigerian authorities will see the importance of investment yeah. in healthcare. Mm. You know, so that if situations like this uh, develop at home, we will at least have the health infrastructure to be able to provide support. Yeah, and uh, goodness me, we're just so happy that Natal is in remission, he's doing well, but most importantly, we're not there yet. Please go out there and embarrass Nathaniel with all the love he needs by putting your money, you know, in this. We need to get him over 201,000 pounds sterling because I, I'll even say donate more uh, because after all of this, he needs some money. The family needs some money for care and all of that. So donate a lot of money. Reach out to Nathaniel. Please just go out there. Support him as much as you can. And this is a really, really very happy story. It's just, it's just a very good story. I missed all the death and the chaos the pandemic has brought to all of us and the heartbreak. This is just a cherry one. And thank God Nathaniel is back. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus Adiri, Michael Wilson, at this one tomorrow. Uh, Aaron Akira, let's give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, spotting activities across the globe. Stay with us. All right. A pleasure to have you back. Still the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Let's go straight to Rotus. Rotus, how's it going, my friend? Good morning. Hello, Rotus. Good morning, very well. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Excellent. Doctor. Good morning, uh, Tundu. Very inspirational story there. And, uh, yeah, you know, you kudos to, that, yeah. to the, the young man that keeps fighting uh, in, in the UK. Um, we want to start with Chris Ngige, the Minister of uh, Labor and Employment. Gave an interview on, on television over the weekend and was saying that the, federal, the Buhari administration is, is doing its best um, on, on employment, on, on, on jobs. Uh, he said that, well, 
the government, it's not the government's job to, to it's not the government's um, purview to create jobs, or rather to create an enabling business environment to allow jobs to thrive. And then he touched on um, conditional cash transfer, saying that, look, uh, whether it be 5,000, 10,000, uh, they are doing their best to try to alleviate poverty. However, when you look at unemployment and you look at poverty, the conditional cash transfer program in Nigeria needs improvement because there is a number of, 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 of criticisms lobbed at it. One being that it's not as transparent as it should be. Two being that it's a bit lopsided in terms of you know, say, people saying that it goes towards party loyalists and uh, is disproportionately you know, uh, distributed to a, a certain part of, of the country. So the case here with the conditional trust, cash transfers is to be able to put more money in the hands of Nigerians so that they can increase their consumption, because consumption has a follow-through effect. Now, we bring in the labor unions. Labor unions just last week said that as far as the subsidy debate is concerned, the federal government needs to revamp the refineries before anybody can even talk about deregulating the downstream sector. Now, the issue with this, when, when, when you look at the uh, refineries, the, the, the $1.5 billion that's been allocated for the Portacot refinery, right? That is a long-term project. Uh, I think it was Timmy Presilva who said that would take about, it's in phases. So you got about the first phase, about 18 to 24 months. The next phase, about another 18, 24 months. It will take a really long time to get those refineries on stream. And the Portacot refinery has a capacity of, I think, about 210,000 barrels per day. So between now and when you revamp the refineries, right, you are looking at a long time of continuing subsidies for the downstream sector, which is really expensive for the NNPC. A lot of people talk about the Dangote refinery. Well, we don't know when Dangote refinery is coming on stream, frankly, right? He's still getting the fertilizer plant on. That's taking a lot of time. We do not have a concrete time stamp for when the Dangote refinery is coming on stream. So between revamping this $1.5 billion um, with Port Harcourt refinery and whenever the Dangote refinery and its 600,000 plus barrel per day um, uh, juggernaut comes on stream, you still have this estimated monthly 130 billion naira uh, 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 subsidy payments that are falling on NNPC and are constricting its ability to transfer to the um, federation account. So we took a look at MNPC. Here's the suggestion and here's the idea. Labor should, should change Labor should change their stance on subsidy and ask for it to be removed. Now, they ask for it to be removed, they should share the proceeds. Let's use the example of the um, Federation account formula, about 52.8% uh, allocation, allocation formula, 52.8% of proceeds goes to the federal government, the remaining 47.2% goes to states and local governments, all right? So about 26 here, 24 there, so altogether 100%. Labor should ask that the proceeds be shared. Now, you share the proceeds of the subsidy because it impacts their workers who are beneficiaries of what comes out of the federation account, right? So essentially, you would now increase what the states are paying to their constituents. Because you are, what you're doing is when you, when you increase that, you are increasing consumption. If you think about every, it's, 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 it's a trickle-down formula. You think about every um, household in Nigeria. Essentially, a household is counted by the income earner. So when you boost the amount of proceeds that are coming from the subsidy that you've removed and shared between the, feder the federal government and the, and the states and the local governments, and they in turn increase the amount of money that is now paid to their constituents, every worker that is the head of a household. What's the average household? Let's say a, 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 a husband, a wife, and two children. So the amount of money that is now increased and is passed down trickles down and you can probably send more, send more children to school, right? And then think about consumption. Now, the cyclical flow, the cyclical flow of income in economics. Consumption drives economies. If you look at Nigeria's Q4 GDP numbers historically, those numbers have done well because of the Yuletide season. More people going out, more artists performing, more people buying gifts, more people buying food, and so on and so forth. And so if you check historically, we've done, Q4 GDP has actually uh, done better than, than prior quarters. 
So think about replicating that Q4 and increasing consumption, right, which would drive hiring because more people that are consuming and now pushes industries to want to hire more, which in turn increases their productivity. This is what labor should be pushing for. It is more transparent. Remember what the uh, Minister of Finance said when um, the governor of Edo State accused the federal government of printing money. She said, look, FAC allocations are open and public, and everybody sees them. So again, this is, this is what I'm suggesting here. Remove the subsidy. If you look at the 130 billion, according to the uh, formula, 52.8 to give you 68 billion to the federal government. The remaining 61.2 billion will go to the states and the local government. Yeah. That increase is what you can now pass on by increasing what you are paying your constituents, right? Which labor would ask for. And each of those members, heads of those households, yeah. will now, that flows down to them. It yeah. flows down to the economy, and you've got more money. So, so, so labor really has to think about the yeah. cyclical flow of income what consumption, increased consumption would do to the, to the economy yeah, okay. and how you would derive that by getting rid of the subsidy. They've got to think more yeah, Labour or, or, yeah, oh, yeah. or the federal government, the rule says. Labour or the federal government. I have to go back to where you started yeah. from the Minister of Labour. Most uninspiring comments, I have to say. Conditional cash transfers is like applying a Band-Aid when you need surgery. Nothing addressing the systemic causes of unemployment. Record unemployment, I might add. Nothing about education and training, nothing about infrastructure, nothing about creating an enabling environment. Well, he did mention that, right. but he did not refer to the hostile environment, the hostile mm -hmm. terrain that he has created, what well, the government has created for entrepreneurs, for job creation, with the lack of well-thought-out stable policies. That is what we need to hear more about. You are sitting here with solutions. Why isn't he? Right. Well, I think we should interrogate some of the policies that the present administration has been talking about. Uh, the uh, major framework for it is that the plan of government is to lift 100 people out of 100 million people out of poverty in 10 years. And we have seen a rollout of a number of policies. You have the economic recovery and growth plan. You have uh, what they call the uh, National Social Register Project, under which we're told about 30 million people uh, from uh, poor and vulnerable households have been registered. And that was what uh, the minister was referring to when he was talking about conditional uh, cash uh, transfer. You have what they call the GEPP, the GEEP, Government and uh, uh, Government Enterprise uh, Project, whatever, Employment and Enterprise Project. You also have what they call the Empower Project. Uh, before then, you had what they call the National Social Investment Project, uh, NSIP. All of these policies uh, in the last uh, less than a decade have been targeted at addressing poverty. I left out one policy, which is the school feeding program, right. which was supposed to address the issue of nutrition. Now, if you look at all of these programs and how they've been operationalized, government has not yet been able to build trust among the people. Right. There is controversy over how that National Social Register was uh, uh, compiled. Right. There is controversy over the uh, disbursement of money, this uh, conditional cash transfer. The school feeding program, there have been concerns expressed. The latest I had was that the, we were being told that the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and uh, Social Development, whose ministry is in charge, uh, reportedly was going from school to school mm -hmm. to go and provide food, mm -hmm. where many Nigerians do not agree with that. So we have to have proper policy alignment. And as Tundu pointed out, it's not just about, you know, all these uh, hard hoc policies, including the one that we witnessed on television, with the Minister of State for Labor and uh, Employment distributing hoes and cutlasses <laughs> as a means of uh, poverty alleviation. Mm. You know, the minister in that television interview talked about creating an enabling environment for business mm. so that business can drive the process. And I think he's right in that regard. But we keep hearing about ease of uh, doing business, yes. uh, enabling environment. But the best enabling environment that you can have mm. is to have a peaceful, secure, stable, society. Yeah. Right. You can provide the infrastructure if there is no security in the yeah. country. All of that will be like uh, winking in the dark. And yeah. then education is important. Tundu mentioned yeah. that. Education. You need a skill set. If unemployment rate is 33.3, and if you aggregate everything, total employment, if you add unemployment to underemployment, Nigeria faces a crisis. Yeah. And if we're to be able to compete in the future, yes, education is critical. We need to address the uh, skill set problem that Nigeria faces. Yeah, I mean, Rotus, your ideas are great. 
I love the idea. We still need to drop subsidy at some point. But you see, let me speak also as somebody that reads economics. I won't call myself an economist. That idea is great in the long run. But what's the short run, Rotus? This is the, removing subsidies. Yes. No, that's short run. No, no. no. That's short, that's no hang, hang on a minute. Hang yeah, on a minute. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Why I say it's great in the long run is what's the short run consequence of removing subsidy? When you pass that money you want to the state governments and they increase the spending of people by paying more to the people that are working in the states, yes. what happens, Rotus? They increase consumption. No. They increase consumption that has already been eaten off by inflation. Don't forget yeah. that. So you, you, have, you, you, have a, you have a sizable number of inflation. Right. You have a terrible forex regime as we speak. Okay. I mean, I keep making the analogy Peter Seller was making to me two days ago. By saying, when they negotiated minimum wage for 18,000 naira, mm. 18,000 naira was about $120 then. About but nine, now... About oh, 62 or 67 now. But now, 30,000 naira is less than $120. Right. Your forex regime has eaten into that money. The economic imbalances are eating into that money. The reason why a lot of people are shouting that once you cut the subsidy now, yes. it reflects on them because the consumption will increase and it will also bring about an inflation in the economy. No, 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 no. So the thing is, when you increase the amount, look, if, if, you, were, if, you, were, if you got a million naira now, what would you do with it? You would spend it, right? Oh, yes. if, if so, if they were to distribute a million naira between the four of us right now, all of us go outside and spend it. We spend it, and that is why I talk about the cyclical flow of income. Yeah. We, it now passes through. So the inflation you're talking about is a good point, but that is supposed to cushion inflationary effects by increasing the amount of pay that they get, and that will now flow through by increasing but, consumption but, but and so pay, on. The, the pay that they get is worthless on arrival, and that's the bone of uh, contention. Right. But the pay they, that they get is what, even, even if you give workers 100,000 or 70,000 yeah. naira a month yeah. now, Rotus, uh -huh. Uh -huh. with the level of inflation in this country, right. it will eat it up. True, but Rufai, the 130, bi up. 130 billion is being spent by NNPC to subsidize fuel prices. So you are Rotus, removing Rotus, that subsidy and passing Rotus, it on to Rotus, individuals. That's I, think, I think what we should do is we have a debate on this and put I it know, online. Know, we, should, we should go back and forth. So that's the, that's the point back yeah. and forth. But thank you so much for your thank time you, as always. You. We move on to Michael Wilson. He joins us now from London. Great to have you, Michael. Yeah, good morning. Um, right, so we're looking at this kind of slow grind back to normality. I know that you're going to cover this uh, later in the programme. But I think one of the things that we should really recognise is that the World Health Organisation is now closely following 10 variants of coronavirus, um, including one from South Africa, one from the UK and so on. Um, it, it, this triple mutant variant is actually very, very concerning indeed. And I want to draw you, I know that, again, you'll be talking about this later on, but 20 million cases in India uh, taking it to uh, beyond um, what they, the, the, whatever public health um, organisation they have there can actually handle. That's a deeply, deeply uh, disturbing uh, statistic, I feel. However, therefore, um, on to Asia markets then, and um, stocks in Asia Pacific, very mixed and so on. Japan and China still closed for holidays, as I said. Hong Kong up very, very slightly. Um, Asian equity markets have opened, your brothers, well, have been continuing through the night in our time. Um, in a rather sedate uh, manner, they've not really known what to do. I'll come on to some of the things that may have been affecting them shortly. Um, overnight, the S&P up about a quarter of a percent, Nasdaq down about half a percent, Dow Jones up three quarters of a percent. So again, not, not a lot of um, movement there. Um, the opening of New York is going to be quite significant. That's helped the oil price. I'll talk about that again uh, later on, but most things relatively directionless. Um, Here's, here's some general news out of China. I know they're closed for holiday, but this is an important one. China's bond defaults uh, um, are, are concentrated on parts of the, uh, of the country uh, where there could be greater pressure on industry because of new restrictions on carbon emissions. That's according to Nomura. 15 regions of, of China, including Beijing and Inner Mongolia, um, are, are adding to this feeling of economic disparity um, in, in the country. Uh, GDP growth in the north lagging um, that of the south. Um, so it means that China may be pledging to reduce these carbon emissions, but 
it will have a significant effect on the northern region's economy in China. We'll have more on that in the months to come, I'm sure. Um, the future of Apple's App Store um, and how it charges developers. Now, this could come under uh, attack. This is the maker of the Fortnite video game. Um, You'll, you'll know about that if you've got kids. You may even play it yourself. But Epic Games are trying to crack open Apple's grip on the App Store, um, the virtual marketplace and so on. Uh, it earns Apple billions of dollars every year, generates contact for iPhones and the rest of it. But the terms to get on it are non-negotiable. And um, Epic's lawyers who, who own Fortnite are now saying this is an unfair monopoly. So another another assault on big tech, which uh, we're going to see a lot more of that, I'm sure. Uh, interesting thing, though, that investors actually quite like monopolies because they get better get better results from their shares. But that's probably a, a philosophical point. Um, so we got the manufacturing figures out from the United States yesterday. ISM manufacturing, slightly disappointing. It was expected to be 65. This is an index, you know, rather like a confidence index. It only came out at 60. It's still expansionary, but um, and it's not awful, but it does show, again, the disparity of what's actually happening in the United States in terms of regions versus regions and so on. Now, how about this then? Would you like to be a lawyer doing the, what is it, $130 billion um, Gates settlement for their divorce? Bill and Melinda Gates have announced their divorce after 27 years um, of uh, marriage, saying we can no longer grow old as a couple together. A great deal of thought, work on a relationship, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much indeed. Lawyers will make a lot of money. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Melinda. Um, the organisation has spent between them billions fighting causes of infectious diseases and encouraging vaccinations in children. So they've done a lot of good work, but they're not going to grow old together. Uh, Warren Buffett has named his uh, successor. Remember Warren Buffett, Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, um, a lot of a lot of uh, activity over the weekend. He's uh, confirmed his vice chairman, Greg Abel, will succeed him as chief executive. Warren himself, not giving up, though. He may be old, but he's not giving up. He's 90 years old, but he's still going to remain at the helm of the company. Um, but there has been speculation for more than a decade about who will actually, actually succeed him. What will Berkshire Hathaway do without, will, without Mr. Buffett when he goes? Yeah. OK, to the UK. And we're hosting a G7 meeting, virtually, of course, um, uh, for a bit. Then we hope face to face. Uh, this is the first time face to face in two years. Um, we'll be talking about Myanmar, Russia, China, Iran and so on. All those kind of big geopolitical things that are affecting us at the moment. And the G7 group. Now, here's the thing. Is it is it really representative of anything? The so-called advanced economies, UK, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan and the United States. But the important thing is here that Australia, India, South Korea and South Africa have been invited along as guests to the three day summit. So what the UK is trying to do is is to increase its ties with the Indo-Pacific region. And on that, the UK-India trade deal, Prime Minister's announced that. We know that he was talking about that last week. I brought that to you. Um, it should be about a billion dollars. Whether it actually happens or not, very, very difficult, difficult to say. A lot of companies will be saying they have done business, big ones like Vodafone, for example, did business with, um, with India and are still awaiting payment. So there's a lot to go there. It's hoping that um, the biochemical chemicals, uh, telephone technology, fruit and medical devices and so on, all those kind of mixtures will actually uh, result with a, um, a bit of better cooperation, trade cooperation between our two countries. Oil, finally, commodities rallies um, on US opening, really, you know, New York opening and the rest of it. Um, dollars slightly weaker as well. That tends to help the oil price. And gold, well, bouncing around, it's sort of finding resistance at $1,800. Um, it's dollars a barrel, what am I saying? $1,800 uh, 1800 an ounce. Um, and it not really moving out of that range. Nothing will really test that until we get another emergency, which of course could happen in the next 10 minutes, or not as the case may be. That's your global Thank view. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We discussed Epic Games briefly yesterday. Dr. Abati raised it. You've just said where the investors will lie, but where do you think the courts will, and also the US government, on the broader picture of anti-competition games? You will see that Epic Games has acquired an artist's portfolio and is putting their money where their mouth is and has dropped their commission to 12%, as opposed to Apple, their app stores, 30%, which they feel is greedy. What do you think will happen there? That's the first question. Secondly, I wanted to talk to you about Pandora and their lab-grown diamonds. I don't buy all that diamonds are God's best friend guff. That's advertising. But what do you think of lab-grown diamonds, especially in view of conflict diamonds and all of those scandals? Do you think that will take hold in the market? 
Uh, well, I, do you know what? When I, I look at Pandora ads and my wife and I laugh at them, she says, but they're not real, you know, so what can I do, really? I, I can't, I'd rather, I, I'd, I'd rather not step to that minefield, if you don't mind, actually, because, um, you know, she, she does quite well. I, Pandora is, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's like a poor man's Tiffany's, really, isn't it? You know, I, I, I really don't want to get involved in that. Oh Kimberly oh Process, That's not Blood Diamonds. What about that? I'm not good, I'm not good on, I'm not good on jewellery. I, uh, my wife has plenty of diamonds and that's the matter between her and me, quite honestly. Pandora's a poor man's Tiffany's. Um, <laughs> as far as, as far as, far as Epic's concerned, um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I don't know Fortnite. I mean, I, I assume it's a video game and I, I know the kids it's play, I don't. Um, all right, okay, okay. Uh, but, but the thing about it is that, as I said, I think what we're seeing here, if, you know, if a company like Epic, which is a world-beating company, and that game certainly is a world-beater, is actually protesting about Apple, then other people who want to get on those apps will be doing exactly the same kind of thing. And I think it, I think that you know, Epic is, is riding a wave, basically, of, of a lot of um, disquiet about the way in which you know, technology, technology companies like Apple appear to be um, monopolistic. Now, investors like that, as I said, because it gives them very good returns. You don't want things split up you're an investor as a consumer you do so we're caught between those two kind of things so yes i think it's i think it is a, a very important step down the road and once again the lawyers will make a lot of money out of this well, two quick things <clears throat> the first is uh, bill and uh, melinda uh, uh, gates uh, their divorce i mean celebrity couples some of the uh, two of the most powerful uh, you know persons in the world now would there be any financial implications uh, you know in terms of how it affects business long term and then secondly, uh, what do we know about the separation contract uh, that has been mentioned in this uh, divorce uh, process, if you have any information in that regard? And then Berkshire Hathaway. Yes, finally, uh, they've been able to work out their succession plan after Greg Abel, Ajit Jain uh, would uh, step in. And, uh, you know, Buffett is saying, well, whatever happens, uh, Greg Abel will keep the culture. What culture is he talking about? Um, culture of decentralization or more capital investment he he is he, he he is always he hasn't always beat the market i mean he's he's non-speculative what he does is the berkshire hathaway way of doing things is to what we would call kick the tires in other words you go around the company and you take a look at it you find out what the the skill set of the management is you look at whether their markets are good and of course you look to see whether it's overpriced or not no surprise that he came out over the weekend and was very much against cryptocurrencies including bitcoin which he said they do have their place but they are speculative mm. it's nothing to do with seasoned investment now d he will not take his eye off the ball um this is the problem with companies like berkshire hathaway it's the same with the murdoch empire it's the same with virgin if you have a central strong figure how do you actually replace those and how do you 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 you, you um, work out where the company is actually going over the following years so it's taken a small step in that direction not a very interesting one i mean they've got the 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 you know the the deputy ceo to be ceo well yeah okay so he's going to keep going with the berkshire hathaway philosophy which is as i've just explained i i think that's perfectly fine i think we are now though moving away from that and we're moving into very much more uncharted waters whether the berkshire hathaway thing actually works we'll see about that i i really don't know you were asking about Bill Gates, and I'm not, I'm not privy to their settlement. Whatever, all I know is the total is $130 uh, billion, which is, which is no bad thing. And it includes, I think there's a yacht or two, probably some properties and so on. Will it, will it affect um, economies? I don't think it will, no, to be honest. I mean, still, $130 billion is a is a misplaced decimal point in the, in, in, in the world, quite honestly. Will it affect Microsoft? No, I don't think so. I think Microsoft will, will still continue. And as, as as we as we notice it sh it's shifted hasn't it from you know being the, the, this this kind of social media facing thing into very much more of a, a of an integrated and personal finance company which is w where it's actually going as, as well as obviously doing software and so on no i, I think i think it'll probably that it, it, it'll find its way i don't think i don't think it'll have any effect on the world economies though All much right. more important things to worry about than a divorce i mean most importantly my heart breaks because i'm together forever kind of person uh Wish them both the best. But I want to talk about Verizon and Yahoo. What is happening to Verizon and Yahoo?
They've sold Yahoo now for the third or the fourth time. Why is that Yahoo never became a success? And uh, secondly, I'd like to, you to look at the oil prices again and tell me, are we getting to that perfect point? Is it near $70 per barrel inch? Will that just be the perfect point? Or it will go overbought, like you, you, know, you, you said a friend of yours predicted and said, okay, it's going to go up to uh, over $70 per barrel. But Verizon, Yahoo, Yahoo seemed not to be doing well. They can't get you right. They've sold the company over and over again, and Verizon can't pull it together. Yeah, I, I, I really, I mean, so, so what you've seen is a divestment, really, from, from Verizon. Uh, and, and I can understand, in a sense, why they've done it. I think Yahoo lost that. If you look at the web pages now, Yahoo has not become a verb in the same way that Google has, has it? Yeah. That's a noun yeah. becoming a verb, a bit like vacuum cleaning, you know, and all the rest of it. Go, to Google something, we all understand. You don't say to Yahoo something, do you? Yeah. That, 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 I, I don't know why they've missed out on that, but Google certainly, you know, di did lots of things. It's even got cryptocurrency, hasn't it now? I mean, to, to, to actually keep going. So it's, it's moved on. I don't think that Yahoo is a good brand at all, quite honestly. I mean, I know it. Like, like you do, but it's nowhere near Google, and it's, and it's too dissipated in its various spaces, so I would have got, got rid of it too. Um, what, was, what was the other thing oil, you were asking me? Price, it's, it's inching to about $67 okay. per bar. Right, so, so the, the, the guy's not a friend of mine. He's called Daniel Jurgen. Okay. I, I interviewed him many, many years ago. Um, he's, he's very knows a lot about the oil business. He's r widely regarded as somebody, and he was saying it's going to creep up again. I think it probably will. I think that the, I think what 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 he's trying. I think what he's trying to say is that countries who are dependent upon oil revenues are seeing the writing on the wall. They're seeing the fact that you know clearly we. W I don't know whether we're going to reach. I don't, who knows? Well, I don't know whether we reach peak oil. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you if I did, would I? I'd be investing in it. You know, I just don't. I don't know. But everything points towards it actually happening. And therefore, what he's saying is that he thinks that by the end of the year. The demand will have outstripped supply, number one. Number two, oil revenue producing companies will want to capitalise on oil for as long as they can. And that will have okay. the effect of pushing the price. That, that's okay. all he's saying. But okay, doesn't friend. alter the sweet. Uh, I mean, Michael, thank you so much for your time. We'll talk about oil and all the sweet spots tomorrow. I will go quickly to Adesua tomorrow. We'll talk COVID-19. Adesua, how's it going? Very well. Thank you, Rufai. Oh, good this morning. This is not the hair I want to see. Uh, good kidding. morning, Dr. Abbasi. <laughs> and good morning, Tsunjum. Good morning. Uh, COVID-19 has now killed over 3.2 million people globally and infected over 153 million others uh, worldwide. Uh, that's the latest data by Johns Hopkins University. However, the WHO says there have been more cases of COVID-19 reported in the last two weeks than during the first six months of the pandemic. This paints a picture of what exactly we are dealing with at the moment. Now, it also says that India and Brazil account for more than half of last week's cases. Uh, but there are many countries all over the world that face a very fragile situation, according to the DG of the WHO, Tedros Ghebreyesus. He's also warning that what's happening in India and Brazil can happen anywhere in the world unless we all take these public health precautions seriously. Now, here in Nigeria, we're still on that downward trajectory. Uh, 18 new cases were recorded. For the day, uh, Lagos State posted eight new infections as the largest. Uh, in the last 24 hours, about 7,000 more people got their first jab of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine in Nigeria. And even though Nigeria has vaccinated only about 1% of her population, it is one of the countries on the continent of Africa that has given out the most jabs so far. This paints a picture of what exactly is also happening on the continent of Africa. Meanwhile, the Lagos State government says that uh, it has put all its facilities on red high alert uh, to pick up early trends that may suggest a third wave of COVID-19 in the states. Uh, the state commissioner for health, Professor Ake Abayomi, in a statement yesterday warned that a trigger for a third wave of COVID-19 in uh, Nigeria's epicenter, Lagos, was likely to be importation of new strains uh, from inbound travelers, and that the state is not leaving anything to chance. It also says that it is prepared to enforce the new travel advisory by the federal government, which comes into effect today. Remember, uh, the travel advisory uh, put in place, especially for those coming in from India, Brazil, and Turkey. 
The commissioner added that the defaulters will be fined while their passports, uh, or while passports of indig indigenous passengers will be forwarded to the authorities for deactivations, and of course, foreigners may be subject to deportation. Well, let's go to India now. As its health system crumbles under the weight of new cases spiraling out of control, hospitals running out of beds, and of course, oxygen, India has now postponed exams for trainee doctors and nurses to help fight the world's biggest surge in coronavirus infections. Uh, the total number of infections so far rose to just uh, a bit short of 20 million the last time I checked. And this is propelled by a 12th straight day of more than 300,000 new infections. They've only had two days of decline so far in India, but they've had over 300,000 cases for 12 straight days. Uh, hospitals are filled to capacity, supplies of medical uh, oxygen have run short, even as international aid begins to arrive in India. But despite this dire situation, only about 11 states in India out of 28 have actually put in measures to curb movement to stem infections. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is so reluctant, he remains reluctant to announce a national lockdown. Uh, he's concerned about the economy, but a lot of scientists say uh, it is just being Pennywise pounds foolish at the moment. And finally, to South Africa, where the country has now taken its first shipment of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. Uh, South Africa is expecting to get 4.5 million doses by the end of next month. Uh, but the health minister, Mr. Mikize, said they actually received 325,260 doses. And this would be the number they will receive for the next week uh, till the end of this month. It will then pick up to over 600,000 next month, and then, of course, a cumulative number of 4.5 million. Uh, South Africa has so far inoculated only about uh, 318,000 people in the country. Uh, it has seen an infection of more than 1.5 million cases, and of course, 54,000 fatalities. Uh, you will recall that South Africa uh, opted for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. It also had to pause that, uh, with uh, fears of blood clots, but has resumed that. Well, you recall uh, that, uh, yes, you've traced the uh, trajectory with regard to immunization in South Africa, but we shouldn't be surprised that they are now, uh, you know, um, opting for the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. In the uh, first week of April, Pfizer and BioNTech, they issued a report after the phase three uh, clinical trials to remind everyone that the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine, which is a two-dose, you know, uh, vaccine, uh, had uh, indicated a safety and effective rate of about 91.3%. That rate was even higher in the United States, according to the reports. And it was on the basis of that that Pfizer decided to go ahead to apply for uh, the, what they call a biologics license uh, in the United States through the Food and Drug Administration, so that it would be possible to move from emergency approval, which is what many of these uh, vaccines have at the moment, to full uh, approval. Another thing is that we're told that the Pfizer vaccine is effective, you know, uh, even after six months after it's been uh, administered, and that no serious safety concerns mm -hmm. were reported in the research. And more importantly, South Africa will have gone for this uh, Pfizer vaccine because part of the report after that phase three uh, uh, trial indicated that it is effective against the uh, variant, the South African variant, which is the B1.351 uh, variant that they have in uh, South Africa. But, you know, I'll be also interested in what Nigeria is doing. How soon are we going to get additional vaccines so that, you know, the shortfall that has been reported can be uh, better addressed? As for the Lagos State Government, again, uh, words of commendation for you know, the Lagos State Government authorities. This is about the second update uh, that Lagos State will be giving us in two weeks. Yes. And I think it's impressive that they are on top of the situation, both the incident commander and the commissioner uh, for health. And what we're being told is that, look, with what is happening in India and elsewhere, we could also have a third wave here. And if you follow, if, as, as you have reported the situation in India, we don't want to have that here. You know, and the best way, according to the uh, commissioner, is for all of us to continue to follow the protocols, mm. the guidelines, while government plays its own part in terms of enforcing the rules and also ensuring uh, that the uh, vaccines are made available and that the immunization program can continue. Finally, as for India, I don't see how 
they will do it in India. They need a complete national lockdown. Narendra Modi may be uh, reluctant, but that's probably, you know, what can help them. And that's what the medical experts, even in India itself, are saying. They don't even have vaccines anymore. Yeah. The Serum Institute of India says it can't even have access to raw materials. Yeah. Now, if India, that is the largest producer of vaccines in the world, cannot produce vaccines, I mean, it means the rest of us are also terribly, you know, in danger. That's so right. these, are the, these are the issues. Well, I feel that Narendra Modi is being completely irresponsible right now. And I think the people need to take their protest up a notch or two because of the rate at which people are dying. I just why you just mentioned how trainees, um, doctors have been taking out to join this fight against COVID-19. But it's not all about personnel, is it? No. There is a shortage of everything from hospital beds to oxygen. Those stories keep continuing about how desperate searches for oxygen often end up in disappointments and in death. And Modi is still thinking about the economy. It's completely baffling. And I join you, Dr. Abatin, commending the Lagos State uh, Ministry for Health. Very well written um, statement there. Got into all the details and a warning about complacency. We must not allow what has happened to India, tragic as it is, we must not allow it to befall us. And it's entirely possible. The most gory sight that came out of India for me was a man begging police officers for an oxygen bottle or cylinder, cylinder I should for say, his mom. for his mom. And his mom died two hours after. After 12 hospitals. After 12 hospitals, because yes. the police officer wanted to give the oxygen to, to the VIP. And that's what India has become. It's become a basket case. They say over 400,000 cases scratched out this hour. There are reports coming out of India that it could be 30 times more. Yes. So it could be really over one point something or four million cases per day happening in India. And amidst all of this, you see, that's why leadership counts. And I, I hope everybody can take learnings from this. Amidst all of this, uh, Modi is still concerned with his BJP party losing West Bengal. That's what he's still crying about, like a cry, cry baby. And when they say money must go, I don't know why people are saying he must stay. That's just clear sentiments. How do you judge a leader by performance in a time of crisis? If Serum Institute, and by the way, Serum Institute is a private organization. If they can't get the materials to produce the vaccine, has not even affected our own vaccine campaign here because they can't churn out more vaccines. And Modi is treating the issue with kid love. He's still playing politics. He's still asking questions where he lost in West Bengal and some other areas when he should fix his country at a point in time like that. And India's must rise up because the country is going nowhere. They're losing doctors by the minute. They're losing the essence of what their country should be. People are dying in droves. People are so scared they can't even go to the ATM machine. And amidst all of this, he still plays politics. Thank you, uh, this one. I appreciate Thank you, you for your time. Bye. Thank you, guys. Yeah.